So um, I just want to just briefly introduce myself before I begin. Um, my name's Joe Bolston and I run a business called New Light Property. Uh, my business is relatively new, it was launched this year and um, we're um, developing commercial property into residential property, some that will be sold, some that will be um, kept and rented. Um, so you might be thinking to yourself, well, what, what can she possibly teach me about um, interior design and HMOs? Well, um, up until um, last year when I left my corporate job, I used to work as an interior designer and I used to work in the public sector um, for local government predominantly. Um, and in my spare time, I used to help people um, with rental stuff and HMA properties as well. And there's a massive synergy between public sector buildings and, and rental or HMO properties, because in the public sector, they're all the time pushing um, the design aesthetic. Um, they want the, the buildings to look beautiful, um, but they have very little money to spend and it all has to be highly accounted for. Um, and they're also always got an eye on the durability of what they're producing, um, the cleanability, it has to be robust because when you're, um, when you're producing buildings that the public are going to use, um, they don't take as much care of things as you would if you, as you owned something. So there's some massive synergies between the two things that's so really helped me when I've, um, when I've been helping others who have got HMOs to design. Um, so I've enlisted the help of a few lovely ladies this morning to bring you some kind of case study pictures to show you um, what I'm talking about in real time. And um, I've got um, some pieces, some photographs that you're going to see through the presentation from Kate Day from uh, Chichester Living and Annabelle Brewer from Lurline Property and also from our lovely Ruth um, Hobbs from her Urban Lofts because I think all these three ladies are doing fantastic jobs with their HMOs and they're really pushing the boundaries and elevating them. And what that does is it really corners the market in their areas. So um, let's go forward. I've got a question for you. Um, if you were gonna be going somewhere new and you were gonna be renting a room to live in, where would you prefer to live? And this is, um, this is something that I found on my local uh, spare room. This is up for rent at the moment if you're up for it. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't really fancy it. Um, whereas if I saw this on Spare Room, what would you prefer to do? I think I would definitely prefer to, to go here. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about this because um, a lot of this is down to, well, obviously, clearly the basics of the buildings are quite different. One is looking very tatty and this one's beautiful. Um, a lot of it's down to the quality of the photographs. Um, always get prof professional photographs taken, don't rely on your agent because if you have one because you just can't necessarily trust what they're going to produce for you. Um, but this is relevant to any kind of property that you're going to be selling or advertising for rent. Um, when somebody is looking through a portal to to take somewhere on, so whether they're looking at Rightmove or Zoopla or whether it's spare room, they're gonna be clicking through hundreds of pictures and just making really quick, it's two seconds to decide whether or not they're interested in that property or not. And if they're interested in that property, then they're gonna click into that link, but they're gonna spend 10 seconds deciding whether or not they actually like it enough to pursue it. That's the time that you've got to capture them. Two seconds as they're scrolling through. And it really does highlight the importance of um, getting the interior right but it's about how that relates to the marketing of your property and the brand of your business um, and so that's kind of my starting point for you today um, and I think it's really really important that you you start this process thinking about the, the brand of your business what you are trying to convey in your business um, thinking about your ideal customer, who is it that's going to come and live in your property and um, you know what do they need, what do they want from the property, how can you help them um, and when you start to do that you'll start to understand more about what you need to provide in the interior design. Um, I just want to flick back to this because 
this is a really great case study actually um, because I know that Kate finished this property um, during lockdown and it went onto the market as soon as she could get it on the market after lockdown. Um, the rooms are filled and she had a 100% conversion rate on the rooms. So she, um, she also had prices it and it's slightly toppy for the area. In fact, it is toppy for the area. So although it's high for the area, people are prepared to pay for it. And, I, and having spoken to her, she said to me that she literally has conversations with her, um, her customers that they say, well, it's, it, you know, I deserve it. I want to live somewhere really beautiful. That is the sort of person that you want in your house because it's actually a proven fact that if you give someone something to look after that's beautiful, they are much more likely to look after it for you. Um, so they are also much more likely to want to stay here and they're also more likely to recommend you to somebody else. So these are your perfect, perfect customers and um, it's a brilliant case study. But what Kate's done is she's really understood who her um, clients are. They, tend, they are young professionals. They tend to be students, uh, sorry, uh, student doctors on rotation or teachers. Um, and so something that's quite important for those guys is if they're student doctors, for example, they're going to be moving around the country a lot um, on rotation and they're not going to know anybody. So they're coming to stay in a new city in a house where they don't know anybody. And so what she's really done that's made it special is to create a real sense of community around the property. And I think um, that whether it's a student property or a young professional market, that's something that they can really buy into the idea that they're going to generate friendships here and it's going to be somewhere that feels like a home. So this, uh, this kind of translation of your brand is really, really important. And my little tip here is about this idea of a red thread. And that is about this taking your brand, projecting that into your marketing and your interior or your interior into your marketing, whichever way around. And it being, and it's sort of just following through and it can literally follow through into, um, you know, the materials that you use and the colours that you use in your interiors. So it's a really great way of introducing it. Just to start the very basics then, um, there are some things that you need to comply with when you're designing a, an HMO. Um, and so one of the things is that each local, um, uh, local office will have its own guidelines as to what they expect for you to provide in your building. And this is mandatory stuff. So you need to be aware of it. Um, it's easy to find, I, you can see on my screen here, my local authority is Portsmouth City. I literally typed it into Google and it came up. It's a, a, quite a nice long PDF document, but it talks about all the important things that you need to provide in your building and that they will expect to see before they give you a license. So this is stuff like um, providing correct lighting levels, um, things like your space standards. So that's about literally the room sizes that they, as a minimum, expect you to provide. Um, so sizes and uh, the type of equipment that they require you to have in kitchens, um, bathroom provisions, um, it will include all of the stuff like the fire standards that you need to give, make sure that your building up. It's really important, obviously, for health and safety that you comply with all of this stuff. And it should also give an outline of the kind of legal requirements that you have as well. When you take on a building, um, you may well have a professional team with you. You might have an architect, you might have an interior designer who's going to help you. Um, that would in my preference, even as encouraged, you have that, you you have an interest in interiors. So many resources that you can tap into, in Instagram and Pinterest that can help you to come up with ideas. Um, if you have an interior designer or an architect on board, though, they will be aware of uh, things like building regulations, uh, the approved documents that they need that you're building needs to comply with okay um, but if you're doing it yourself then you just need to be aware that there are building regulations that you'll need to comply as well as the, uh, the HMO recommendations so the tip here is absolutely make sure that your local HMO officer is your friend 
okay because they um they're going to come and give you uh, a sign off on your building they're going to come give you a license um, if you've got any problems they can help you troubleshoot them they may even know of things like future directives that are going to come in that aren't in yet that you might need to out um, and they can help you therefore future proof your properties um, so it's really really worth getting them on board and and you know checking in with them regularly and making making building a relationship with them so just a few more things about the con kind of strategics of getting an interior together when you're doing a design project um, I like to talk about this because sometimes there's a misconception that interior design is about um, you know soft furnishings and, and that's very much um, I, I want to just make sure that people understand that if you if you're if you have an interior de designer on board or you're looking at interior design it's a lot more than that and it starts right at the very beginning of the project particularly if you're employing a team to help you get them involved as early as you can with a project and this would be interior a project you're working on whether it's you know um development or you know, a commercial building or just a house always get your designers in really early because they have um you know a different slant on the way that people use spaces and they can really help you with that so nice and early you'll you'll have other bits uh, further through the design uh, and build process where that you'll need to have somebody there or to do it because you're going to have a fit out stage at the end for example where you're going to have to go in and do the soft burnishing bit and the photographing and all that stuff to put it to market um, but start it early and there's some things to think about um, because what I want you to, to do is to always work with the plan so that when you're making internal layout changes, you're absolutely sure that they bring you the maximum value possible uh, rather than making changes for the sake of it. Um, and I want you to think about things like comfort in the building. So this is about maximizing the space that you have and making sure that you bring in natural light wherever possible. Um, if you are lacking in natural light it's about putting in artificial light and maybe that's in a clever way that kind of helps to maximize the spaces um, comfort and privacy so this is stuff like sound transmission if you have a shared house where people are going to be uh, doing shift work for instance someone might just decide they want to run the washing machine all night and you, the last thing you want is for that washing machine to be backed onto somebody's bedroom where they're trying to sleep because you're just going to get complaints so um, thinking about those things when you're doing layouts is really important also little things like um, views into the rooms if you have got bedrooms that go along a corridor west where near the front door for instance um, if the door was open can you look straight in and see the bed if you can avoid that it would be great wouldn't it because the last thing you want to do is to feel that you're privacy is um, impeded by people walking past all the time so just little things like that thinking about um, upgrading your spec rather than scrimping on spec um, it can be really important particularly in terms of um, health and safety stuff for instance um, if you're putting having to put in new fire doors into a building um, fd20 fire doors um, they're quite low on spec but for the same kind of cost you can put in a high grade so you know with stuff like that it's not worth the scrimping you need to make sure that you've done everything you can to make your buildings um, safe we talked a little bit about future proofing when you get your hmo officer on board um, but it's better to know anything that might be coming up coming in in the future now when you're doing a big refurb rather than having to try and retrofit stuff later um, thinking about maybe providing separate utility areas and storage so that it's not all crammed into a kitchen if you can do that really really great and also right at the start make sure that you understand where you need things like power sockets to go you can never have enough power sockets things like the light fittings um tv points maybe you need to install some heavier duty um cabling for internet um so that you can provide fast internet because fast internet um and um, you know, stable internet is something that will really help to sell your property as well. 
I'm going to go through these things in a bit more detail because I want to go through these typical spaces with you. So obviously this is a kitchen. Um, and for me, it's about how can you enhance the, the basic product stuff because you don't want to go too high in cost um, in a way that just makes it look fantastic. So, um, and I think these, these two examples do it really well. So, um, you're looking for finishes that are durable and clean easy. That is a given. In a kitchen, it's a real given. Anything like water spillages, um, they can ruin things like cupboards. So it's really important. Now, for instance, both of these kitchens have got laminate worktops. Um, one of the little things that I think really elevates a laminate worktop is to have a square edge profile on the front of it. You can see that in both of these. Um, it's a slight uplifting cost. The traditional kind of laminate worktops that people think of have got a real round bull-nosed edge on them and they look really um, kind of old fashioned. But the moment you use the square edge profile or the tight radius edge, um, it really elevates it. And you can see that being used here. And even if you've got very basic cupboard units, something that can just lift it is by just changing the handles. Um, to something that's not the basic standard D handle. I love that in the one on the right here that the handles have been made black to match in with the in with the cupboards. Colour of the cupboards is important too um, because white is kind of the given basic. I like these dark ones, they give such an impact um, and they also stop you from seeing lots of kind of stains and, and things dripping down them. Um, my personal preference with cupboards is to go with flat fronts, no panels. Um, and the reason for that is that when fluid <laughs> runs down a door, it gathers in that channel at the bottom caused by the panels and it will eventually blow a cheap door apart. Um, and that's something you don't really want. So that, that's my kind of preference and that's the reason why. So with this sort of thinking, it's all about reducing the number of junctions and thresholds. Um, that you can in all the surfaces and I think that will really help you with future maintenance. Um, something that I always do and it's kind of one of my top tips, it doesn't matter how basic your tiles are and cheap your tiles are, if you've gone with, even if it was just a square white tile, um, the metro tile or, or something a bit funkier and it's a white plain tile, if you put a grey grout on it, um, it's not going to stain, it's not going to go yellow. Often, you know, water, oils from the back, a splash back will, will really ruin grout quite quickly, but it doesn't happen with a grey one. And they're really commonly available. So there's no reason why you can't find one. And they range from like light grey through to really heavy dark grey. It's a fantastic thing. Um, just to talk about a little bit about appliances. Um, Bear in mind that you want to be able to access these for maintenance over time uh, and you want to do that easily. So while having um, door fronts over appliances looks really slick, um, it's a lot easier if you can actually get to the appliance and, and pull it out and replace it without having to fiddle around with plinths and all that kind of stuff. So I think um, personally I would avoid built in appliances and I would use built under appliances. Um, and another little quick thing, um, and it's back to this kind of water ingress, if you ask your builder to just run around the base of your plinths with a clear mastic, um, it'll, seal, it'll seal it between the floor and the, and the plinth and you won't get water travelling underneath and blowing the plinths. Um, it's such a small thing but um, it, it can make you know, the difference to the longevity. Both of these kitchens have got a vinyl floor. Um, my preference is for vinyl floor um, over tiled floors if you can. Um, I just, it's a seamless finish, there's no grout. Um, it's cleanable, it's impenetrable. You can get slip resistant levels in it if you feel that that's a worry, maybe more so in a bathroom. Um, be mindful that slip resistant levels means that uh, you can't clean it as easily, but there's so many reasons why I would go with a vinyl over a tile any day of the week and a laminate as well, much less likely to fail on you. So um, 
one last thing in the kitchens then, and it's about storage. Um, you can never have enough storage. And I think um, certainly with things like bins, bins can be forgotten about. If you've got a massive house of people, they're going to produce a lot of rubbish. So um, try to think about where you can fit in a gap, a recess somewhere, or even a separate, a separate space where bins can be tucked away accessed easily but not um not viewed and leave enough space for it because you just don't want tons of piles of rubbish ruining your beautiful kitchens um and these kitchen areas uh above all create this opportunity for um a sense of community and i think it's super important that you try to do that in any way that you can um, I just think it's it's so it's such a strong thing um, to to draw people to your property if they could, they feel that they can become part of a community there. This is another example. This is um, urban lofts, which is um, Ruth one of Ruth's projects. Um, but again, you see this kind of layout of the kitchen with the island and the chairs up against it, but other little seating areas around the room, and you can just imagine people having a lot of activity and interaction here and really enjoying being in the space. I think it's fantastic. Don't neglect your outside spaces. Um, you know, particularly at the moment where we've had a really weird time um, with lockdowns. And I know a lot of students have gone home, they haven't been in the houses, but if people are in houses during a lockdown period, the, the ability to go out and use the outside space and even in a normal period the ability to go out and use the outside space um, is a really nice thing and it doesn't have to be expensively done but low maintenance um, little bit of seating and I think also this thing about curb appeal it still matters when you're doing this kind of property just thinking about the approach to the building and making it welcoming making that entrance welcoming so that it feels that it has a sense of home about it. This is about your communal spaces, your kind of travel spaces through the building, which sometimes can be a bit neglected because you just think, oh, they're just, they're just, um, people are just transitioning around the building in them. But they're a great opportunity to add some interest and fun. And um, again, it's that idea of longevity. I'm going to harp on about it quite a lot, but it's important because it's about your future maintenance regime things that you can do here that might help you to maintain so um for example my tip is about sheeny paint finishes sheeny paint finishes meaning something like a silk paint um you could use something like that up to dado height and then above that the cheaper matte paint because it's a really robust finish um it's quite nice because it reflects light around as well so if these spaces are tight it will make it feel a bit a bit more um it bounces the light around and makes it feel, feel sort of bigger. Um, don't, uh, word of warning though, sheeny finishes are not good if the wall is very pitted and, and not very good quality. You're better off with a mat if that's the case. Um, in my uh, career and projects, I've used a lot of um, the robust mats. So something like Dulux Diamond Mat, for instance, um, there's an, an, there's a, it, it's more expensive than a basic mat um, emulsion, but you can scrub it, you can paint over it. It's super, super resilient. So um, Johnson's also do an equivalent, um, as do Crown. Um, and with paints, it's worth just mentioning that if you particularly love um, a palette that comes from um, a boutique manufacturer, such as Farrow and Ball, um, but you don't really want to pay for Farrow and Ball because it comes with quite quite a price tag on it. You can get uh, the more commercial products mixed in those colours. They can colour match them pretty close. It won't be exactly 100%, but pretty close. Um, I've done that in my career as well. When you are looking at banisters, for instance, um, a lot of people touch banisters and white banisters can get really really grubby i absolutely love these dark ones in the middle because i think it's such a it gives that impact but it also is really good at hiding um hiding the dirt if you you know you don't want to see that going forward um i also really like the idea that these transition spaces can be used for uh some kind of fun whether it be accessories decor signage 
And, and I think with any of that stuff, go large and be impactful with it because it, it's far better to do that than to do little tiny things all over the place. Um, this urban loft image at the bottom is great because by incorporating some light into it, it's um, instantly made a, a real feature on that wall um, that's tucked underneath the stairs and potentially could have been quite a dark corner. So I think it, it works really, really well. Um, and the image with the, the little chimp there with his mask on, um, it's, it's a vinyl uh, wall sticker and it's such a, a, a low cost way of making massive impact. And it's really fun. Um, I think, you know, it makes it, makes it feel like a fun place to be and I like that very much. Don't forget that you can also have greenery in your buildings and yes I know you're not going to be there to water it but you can do that with very convincing artificial faux, faux greenery and I think it's a really great thing to do. So we would, I mentioned earlier about um, comfort and sound comfort um, so here's an example of a separate utility space away from the main living space tucked away you can shut the door shut the noise in and really basic spur shelving here you can't get much cheaper but we're just putting on this dark laminate shelving above it 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 lifts it so it doesn't look like a cheap uh, room that's not been thought about it still maintains its, its aesthetic um, as well as having this massive bit of practicality and functionality about it um, I mentioned also earlier about plug sockets and positions and quantity of power sockets around the building. This will create flexibility for the people using it, but it will also um, it also means they're never going to get fed up and run out of plug sockets. Everything people bring with them is going to be <laughs> is going to be electronic or need charging, right? Double socket plus double socket plus USB if needed in a bedroom. Um, really, really, uh, really, really would help with that. So just touching on bathrooms here, um, I would recommend that you avoid wall hung bathroom um, sanitary wear. And I would also recommend that you go with main name manufacturers for sanitary wear. Because if you try to buy something cheaply um, that's not a main name, if it goes wrong, you're going to struggle to get parts to, to replace with. Um, and I've fallen foul of that. So don't <laughs> don't do that because it's really really annoying main name manufacturers uh, floor mounted will uh, avoid wall hung because it's just a, it's just you don't have to worry about anyone leaning on something and it coming away from the wall all of those things again just to, you can uplift really easily with a really funky floor these are just vinyls these two images um, that show floor here they're both vinyl floors um, in a kind of mock tile but they're so impactful um, and otherwise, everything in these rooms is is white, um, but it just really lifts the spaces. And again, just maybe it's just a change of handles on a vanity unit that lift it. Um, I think usually people use tiles. It's the same thing in a, in a shower, tiling trays about um, dark grout for maintenance purposes and also because it looks slick. But what about thinking about um, a, an acrylic wall panel? The image on the bottom right is a shower with a timber effect, acrylic, acrylic wall panel, and it looks fab, um, completely sealed. No water is going to get through that. So another quick tip here, if you want to save energy in your buildings, one thing that you can do is to install automatic lights through your main, kind, these kind of main spaces, so kitchens, bathrooms and hallways. And then as soon as people aren't in them anymore, the lights turn off and you're saving electricity. Don't do it in bedrooms, that's not a sensible thing to do, but these rooms you could do it. So let's have a look at bedrooms then. Um, I feel quite strongly that in a bedroom, your the aim here is to create a neutral backdrop with personal touches. When you're marketing these rooms, these are really going to sell your rooms, um, and you can put the personal touches in, and they really lift them and make them feel homely. That's what people want; they want to feel like they're at home. Um, so it's important when it comes to marketing that you do that. 
but by making it neutral, neutral doesn't have to mean white, by the way, because we've got a dark blue one here, a dark grey one, and a dark teal one, and all of them work as a neutral backdrop. As soon as you take out the vibrant colour throws, the vibrant colour cushions, the pictures off the shelves, and all of the stuff that you'll take away when people move in, um, there will just be a neutral canvas that somebody can bring their own stuff into and make feel their own. And I think that's um, a brilliant way of treating these rooms. And they feel very grown up as well, which, um, you know, I, I, I think it's great, a really great backdrop. Um, make them comfortable. So a comfortable bed, durable, but comfortable, <laughs> comfy chairs. Uh, really important, you could put some faux plants in to make them feel lifelike, include a mirror because it's just a practical thing. For me, comfort's quite important and a lot of that is about light levels. I don't really like to see light coming into the room at night. Um, blackout blinds are an essential thing for me in a bedroom um, and possibly even with a curtain as well. Um, but certainly just think about that. Think about the light that can come into the room. Think it's really important for people. And lots of storage because people are moving with all their kit and they're likely to come with things like suitcases and they need to store them somewhere. So you could store a suitcase under the bed. Um, you could store it in the top of a wardrobe if the wardrobe went floor to ceiling. Maybe you could build the wardrobes in so that people can you know, have more access to that space. Otherwise, you end up with a kind of gap at the top between the wardrobe. In the ceiling which becomes a sort of dumping ground. Um, if you're storing under the bed I think it's better if you can access it at the side of the bed rather than tilting the bed up type storage if you know what I mean. Once a bed has got a mattress on it it's very unlikely that people are going to want to do that. Just want to talk about cleanability in rooms and how you deal with that mainly between clients. Um, you may have to steam mattresses for instance you may have to do a deep clean on the floors. So something that I'm gonna suggest that's a little controversial maybe, because I think most people use carpets in their HMO bedrooms and upstairs because they, there's an, um, a perception of comfort. Um, but you'll notice in the middle picture that there's a vinyl floor on the floor there. And the reason for that is because sometimes, um, this is a really big HMO, sometimes people come with undesirable things like bed bugs and you want to be able to clean it and it's quick and easy to clean a floor like that and if you want it to be comfortable and soft then a rug can go in um, but it, it might be worth considering that. Um, carpets, um, if you're going with carpets again just think about the fibres in the carpet. Um, uh, wool is inherently um, stain resistant but obviously you don't want full wool carpets but a tiny element of wool in it is a good thing don't use nylon because it will flatten within two seconds. So you want a polypropylene with a wool carpet. Um, so just a small tip on spaces, something that can really make spaces feel bigger um, is to match the skirtings and architraves into the wall colour. Even if you've got a feature wall, so if you've got this dark grey or a dark blue, whatever it is, match the skirting in on that wall with that, with that feature colour and it will just make the space feel bigger because your eye isn't suddenly looking for you know horizontal lines around the space and it all kind of blends together better it'll make the room feel bigger so that's a, a little tip there for you on space so obviously we've been through a bit of a, a an odd time and we're kind of coming into a bit of an uncertain time in terms of um um infection and I know that people that have had have students in their houses have had have had um, parents worried about infection control in uh, shared properties, for instance, student properties. So going forward, I thought it would be worth just just running through a quick slide on on some stuff that you can do uh, to help that that you can you can even reassure people with. Obviously, we've talked a, quite a lot today about um, surfaces and how you can um, make them really easy to clean. And that's something that, along with your cleaning regime, you can use to reassure people. What about bathroom provision? So now, 
quite often people think they need to have an ensuite bathroom with every single room and I don't believe that's the case. Sometimes I think that ensuite bathrooms are forced into the plan and actually um, they're not really needed. Um, you do, you, it's good to think about bathrooms and if you've got, if you can kind of split big bathrooms into two smaller ones so that people on the floor have got a shared bathroom but not with so many people, but they don't necessarily always have to have an ensuite bathroom. Um, if you've got a shared bathroom and there's two people that you're proposing share it, what about thinking about providing doubled up stuff in there? What about two sinks? like double sinks. What about two radiators and doubled up storage if you can fit it in? Because at least then you can say, well, you, you're, you'll be sharing a bathroom with the person from that room, but you have your, entirely your own provision in there. It's just an idea. Um, another thing that might be worth thinking about is working spaces within your properties, particularly if, you're, um, if this is for profession, young professionals. If people can't go into work, into the office and work, um, because uh, they're on a rotor with that for, to keep the numbers down or whatever the reason might be, maybe some kind of central workspace in the house might be a good idea. Um, a bit like if you think about co-living, um, because co-living spaces do that. Um, and often in bedrooms, you'll see desks, but I think if you can really make the desk in the bedroom a decent place to work so um, big enough that someone can comfortably work at it if they had to be there all day um, I think that could really be a sell for somebody who knows that they've got to spend a proportion of their time working at home um, and this combined with uh, you know making sure that the internet connection is strong enough and stable in your properties is something that is going to appeal and you can use as a selling point um, so if your market is young professional, I think that is definitely the way to look at it. Um, so just a few little ideas there about maybe how you can think about future proofing your properties in our kind of post lockdown period. So those are my thoughts on HMO design and I, I, I hope I've shared some things with you that's, that are of use. Um, if anybody has any questions, I've just these are my contact details. Um, I don't I don't design interior de interiors anymore, um, so I'm not touting for work. But if anybody has got questions or um, they want to talk to me about any of it, then please do get in touch because I'm more than happy to do so. And um, I'll pass back to Suzanne. I don't know whether anybody had any questions. If they do, I'm happy to answer them. If not. We know that's brilliant, Joe. We haven't got any specific questions, but I think you've given everyone lots to think about there. Definitely going to, I've written a list of things myself. We've just got a few under, under development at the moment. So definitely going to have a look into the uh, things that you've mentioned there. Um, has anybody, I don't think anybody, but you've got lots of lovely comments and a brilliant session, Joe. Oh, um, oh, one question. What about improving curb appeal for your property? Okay, curb appeal. So I would definitely make sure that your front garden is sorted out. I was helping somebody the other day with one and um, the garden was a total mess. It just looked horrible. And I, I feel that, you know, if you're trying to in, instill this sense of pride and ownership over the building, which in turn is going to help people to want to look after it for you, um, the very least, make sure that it's weed free, cleared, there's no rubbish out there. Um, and, you know, paint the front door something welcoming. Why not do it a bright, funky colour that ties in with your branding? Um, just little things like that, I think they make a huge difference. Um, which would you recommend, curtains or blinds? Oh, so, for practicality's sake, you might want to go with blinds but definitely blackout blinds and I've got a bit of a personal thing against um, horizontal blinds because I, I've used them so much in offices that I don't really want to see them in the bedroom. They also don't really completely shut the light out and as I said I just think it's a comfort thing um, particularly in an urban setting you're likely to have street lights outside 
and people want to be able to have a dark room when they go to sleep. Um, you could layer it up and put a curtain, in, a curtain over it to dress it. But if you're going to put a curtain in, um, just to talk about that second, um, full length curtains from ceiling to floor will help to give your room height. So something to bear in mind with curtains. They also do help a bit with insulation, don't they? And they do. And noise and Absolutely. any sort of fabrics that you can put into a building to sort of give a bit of acoustic as well. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. So um, if anybody wants to get in touch with Jo, her contact details are there. And obviously she's on the WhatsApp group as well. Um, so now we're going to hand back 